Right, so Renella Pau, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will just check to see how progress is looking in terms of upcoming audience participants. Jay, can you give me a nod um, when the numbers look like they're hovering at a, a steady, steady figure? Yeah, they're coming in. We have about 50 now, but steadily coming in. Lovely. I can't see that screen, unfortunately. Hello, everybody. Just to say we'll, we'll give it a minute just so that um, the uh, delegates can uh, join us remotely as they come into the system, because it takes a little while for Zoom to get everybody through. Yeah, I think we're, we're ready to, to progress now, and then uh, I'm sure more people will join us shortly. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Jay. Hello, Grosso, um, Fernanda Pau. Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us today, Jochem Eich Anser. Um, I'm Jess Hooper of Marine Energy Wales, and today I'm delighted to be chairing a cross borders session looking across the pond at the international marine renewables interests in Canada and Wales and seeking to share our respective learning and experiences. With the marine renewable energy sector having a growing global focus, we're working with Marine Renewables Canada to build bridges between the industry on either side of the Atlantic. Between Marine Renewables Canada and Marine Energy Wales, we share goals in the pursuit of energy, economic and environmental opportunities associated with the worldwide potential of the ocean renewable energy industry. These include supporting the efforts by industry, governments and research communities to accelerate development of this emerging energy sector. As mutual members of each other's respective organisations, we work to facilitate closer academic cooperation and collaboration between universities undertaking marine renewable research in both the UK and Canada, and we're working to create roundtable and networking opportunities for our respective memberships. Speaking of which, I'd like to extend a warm welcome and thanks to my international counterparts. So today from Marine Renewables Canada, we've got Eliza Oberman. Um, we've also got from the ORE, or Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult Project in Wales, which is the Marine Energy Engineering Centre of Excellence, our colleague uh, Magnus Harold. From FORCE, so the Fundy Ocean Research Centre for Energy, um, a welcome to Tony Wright. And um, from Nova Innovation, uh, based in Wales, we have John Marr. And from DP Energy, with offices on both sides of the pond, uh, Sarah Thomas from Canada and Bethan Sarans from our local office. Thank you very much to my panel for joining us today and to our audience of, at the moment, 75 um, and seemingly increasing. Um, and therefore it promises hopefully to be an interesting session. Firstly, a little bit about Marine Energy Wales. So as a membership organization, we bring together site and technology developers, the supply chain, academia, and the public sector, seeking to establish Wales as a global leader in sustainable emerging offshore renewable energy generation. And in Wales, we're working with the sector to understand how we can use the ocean's natural rhythms to produce clean, sustainable electricity from marine renewable energy and deliver a low carbon economy with its own jobs, skills and prospects. And as a strategic gateway into the sector network, Marine Energy Wales are uniquely placed to promote Welsh capability, champion the Welsh opportunity and encourage strategic relationships, including those international relations looking to the global opportunity. So what does the sector and our membership look like here in Wales? The wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. Marine renewables address, can address fluctuations in these energy sources to ensure that the lights stay on. Generating power from multiple diverse sources is key to delivering a continuous uninterrupted supply of renewable energy to homes in Wales. They also enable energy independence by reducing our reliance on fuels typically imported from abroad to fill these gaps. We're incredibly lucky here in Wales to have the natural resources from tidal stream and wave to floating wind and tidal range around our shores, as shown on this map alongside electrical grid networks to export the power generated and ports to build and transport the devices and a growing test and demonstration network. There's a lot of activity here on the verge of realizing the opportunity of clean blue energy. Across this emerging marine renewable sector, we're now home to 20 international and national wave, tidal and flow developer interests. The images on the right illustrate the diversity of the technologies with activities here in Wales, from low flow tidal kites to tidal stream turbines, floating wind turbines and devices capable of harnessing the power of our waves. Now, I'll hand you over to Eliza from Marine Renewables Canada, so we can hear a little of the Canadian marine renewable picture before hearing from our members about their cross-border experiences. 
over to you, Eliza. I'll stop sharing my screen so you can take over. All right, thanks very much, Jess, and good to be here with all of you today. I'm just gonna get my slides up um, and I assume everybody can see this okay. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about just a general overview of the sector um, in Canada. And my name is Lisa Oberman. I'm the executive director at Marine Renewables Canada. And we are very similar to Marine Energy Wales. So we're a national association. We cover tidal, offshore wind, wave and river current energy. And very similarly, we have quite a few of the same types of members. So we have a little over 100 members, um, technology and project developers, utilities, supply chain researchers, and we also have some municipalities um, as well as public sector members as well. So our main goal really is to advance the sector um, and build a market for it in Canada, but also support our membership in working internationally. And so to do that, we lead education and advocacy and engagement activities. Uh, we do a lot to foster communication amongst our membership um, and help them to find ways to collaborate or opportunities for business development um, between companies. And then obviously we do quite a bit around identifying business development opportunities, both in Canada um, and internationally. So you're going to hear more probably from some of the other speakers about some of the, the specifics on um, activities in Canada in terms of marine renewables, but I thought I would provide just this snapshot of, of what it, that actually looks like across the country. Um, so as I mentioned, we cover several different types of marine renewable energy resources. And as you can see with this map, there's activity on both the West Coast, so the Pacific Coast, and also on the Atlantic Coast. Um, where we have quite a bit of opportunity as well is in river current energy. And so that can be in any province essentially because we have quite a few rivers in Canada and there's a lot of potential for, I would say river, well, all marine renewables with remote communities. Um, so Canada has about 200 remote communities. Many of them are reliant on diesel power. Uh, so that is an opportunity to displace um, diesel by using marine renewables. And some of them are very close to uh, marine renewable energy resources. So just on the West Coast, there's been quite a bit of focus with wave energy um, and the University of Victoria has been leading quite a bit of that activity. There's no, there are no wave energy devices currently um, being demonstrated, but there's been a lot of work at the moment to, to support future deployments and demonstration. Uh, and then as you can see on the, the East Coast, um, particularly around Nova Scotia, we have quite a few tidal energy projects that have been permitted. So all of the ones that you see there, uh, Big Moon, DP, Jupiter Hydro, New Energy, Nova Innovation and Sustainable Marine um, have all received permits um, and some of them have also received supports from the federal government. Um, and you'll hear more from FORCE. Uh, some of those projects are being developed there and others are being developed in um, we say Southwest Nova, but essentially at a lower flow, not that much lower flow, but a lower flow site that allows for smaller scale uh, development and community scale development. So the other aspect I thought that I would highlight, because obviously to see that kind of activity, um, there also needs to be a number of, you know, policies and, and regulations and supports in place. And I thought some of the audience would have interest in this. So um, just in two main areas I, I would want to highlight today. So for the government of Canada, um, well, I will also say that policy and, and legislation is different in some aspects in, in terms of jurisdiction because electricity policy is handled by from a province by province basis. So the government of Canada really provides some of the overarching supports um, and strategies that have supported the sector. Um, so for example, in 2011, they led a roadmap process um, with Marine Renewables Canada develop kind of a strategy for how the sector would move forward. And since then, they've established the Canadian Energy Regulator Act, which provides a new framework for offshore renewables. Uh, they've also imp are implementing the um, Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act, which requires net zero by 2050. And then there's been quite a bit of significant investment um, that's gone into our sector, but also that's available in the future. And I can answer some questions on that if people are interested. Um, but what I thought I'd also highlight is the reason there's a, quite a bit of a development in Nova Scotia is that government has done a lot to support the sector. So they've um, been able to uh, implement and, and develop strategic environmental assessments. They've established tidal feed-in tariffs. 
Uh, they also were, I think, one of the only jurisdictions to establish a specific uh, legislation for marine renewables, the Marine Renewable Energy Act, which then led to a demonstration permitting program. And then some of the overarching policy um, that's been developed also uh, supports reduced GHG emissions. And also there is a new renewable energy standard requiring 80% renewable electricity by 2030. So all of those things create some opportunities for the marine renewable sector. And I'll leave it at that for now, but very happy to answer questions when we get to that point. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Eliza. Um, I was just going to say to our audience, if you've got any questions or remarks for um, any of our presenters, um, myself and Lisa included, please do pop them into the Q&A or the chat um, and we'll manage them from there. We will be having a discussion Q&A session at the end of all of the presentations. So next off, we're going to go to Magnus Harold um, at, from the ORE Catapult um, and I'll hand it straight over to you, Magnus. Thanks, Jess. Uh, can you just confirm that you can see my screen? Full screen. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm Magnus Harad. I work for a company called the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Um, and this is about how we foster innovation in the offshore renewable energy sector. Um, just to provide a bit of a background, I thought it would be worthwhile uh, highlighting the sort of the, the status of the UK. Uh, offshore renewable sector at the moment. So offshore wind now is, is very much being hailed as a UK success story. Um, and there are a number of very good reasons for that. Uh, we have 10 and a half gigawatts installed. Um, I think we were not until not very long ago, we were the, the, you know, we had the greatest amount of installed capacity anywhere in the world, but I think we've now slipped to, to second place uh, because I think, I think China is now in the leading position. But Despite that, it's, it's enough to power 8 million homes here. Um, it's taken us about 20 years to get to that position. Um, and it's an industry that's accelerating because we now have a target of 40 gigawatts by 2030. So we're aiming to roughly quadruple capacity in, in about the next 10 years. Um, and it, it's only going to to, to expand from there as well, it's, it's already been estimated that at least 75 gigawatts will be needed if we're to hit net zero in the UK by, by 2050. But it, it's not just about, um, you know, decarbonizing our, 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 our country, it is, it's also about, you know, some of the other benefits that the sector has brought. So it's created many jobs and um, in many places where those jobs um, have been needed. So in particular in, in coastal communities, uh, which in many cases in the UK, some of our coastal communities uh, have gone through periods of decline. Uh, that might be because they previously had a, a shipbuilding industry, for example, or perhaps a fishing industry. Uh, offshore renewables coming, coming to our coastline has um, both literally and figuratively repowered some of our, our coastal communities in, in the UK. In terms of our, our tidal stream sector, uh, we, we have the, the largest uh, amount of tidal stream energy deployments anywhere in the world. I, I understand at, 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 at least 50% of that is in Scotland alone. Um, and then also in addition to that, many of the leading technology developers are based in the UK. And that's something that we can't say about the, the offshore wind sector. Uh, so we're, we're developing homegrown tidal turbine technology here. And, and that's you know, the nice thing about that is that in, in future projects that will enable a huge amount of U UK content in those projects. And it's something that we will hopefully export to the world. Uh, Nova Innovation is just uh, one of those companies and, you, and you'll hear more from them uh, later on today. It's estimated that tidal stream energy could provide 11% of the UK's electricity demand. Um, that alone is a very impressive figure, but it's about an awful lot more than that. It's about um, you know, the, the predictability of, of, of tidal uh, stream, and not only just in terms of when we'll get the power, but also in terms of how much. Uh, that could be invaluable in, in managing our future electricity networks. 
it's also uh, been a success story from a, from a cost point of view. Um, offshore wind costs have, have plummeted in the space of just a few years, um, as, as the, um, the graph on the right hand side shows. Um, it was only about five years ago that people were still saying that offshore wind is too expensive and could never see it being cost competitive with uh, conventional forms of energy generation. But um, the truth is that projects in construction today are set to be cheaper than existing gas plants. And offshore wind is now one of our, our cheapest forms of, of new electricity generation. That's been achieved uh, by a long term government commitment to the sector. Uh, which really enabled it to, to commercialise with confidence. And this is something that we hope is replicated in our tidal stream sector. And um, for those of you watching the news, uh, last week we had a very positive announcement that um, as part of our next Contracts for Difference allocation round, uh, the government has ring-fenced support for tidal stream energy projects, which in the short term should enable at least uh, 30 megawatts to be installed out of that, that round, uh, but it certainly will hopefully pave the, the way in the future for, for um, you know, a, a fully commercialised industry, uh, much like the, the offshore wind sector here. And uh, cost reduction has been achieved in, in a number of ways in our sector, uh, perhaps the, the biggest of which is the fact that offshore wind turbines are just such phenomenally huge uh, engineering uh, feats these days. Uh, the turbines in development now um, are capable of producing as much as 15 megawatts from, from a single machine. Uh, that's, to put that into perspective, that's enough to power 20,000 homes from a single device um, and is significantly bigger than anything onshore. Uh, typically, the largest machine onshore you'll find is around about four megawatts. Um, but how, that's, how that relates to cost reduction is that larger wind turbines have access to more consistent wind speeds that are found at higher altitudes, meaning that they have an overall higher availability. Um, and also if you install larger but fewer turbines for, for a given capacity, you're reducing the number of installations that you need to make and you're reducing the number of turbines that need to be maintained in a project. And, and both of these things have a huge impact on, on costs. But it, it's important to state that innovation has played uh, an equally important role in, in bringing costs down in, in our sector. And that, that's not just uh, innovations in, in the turbines themselves. Uh, innovations have been found in, in all aspects of offshore renewable energy projects. Um, I've, I've listed a few here, but there, there are thousands of examples, uh, but some maybe perhaps noteworthy examples include um, we have installation vessels now that can operate in a greater range of weather conditions, uh, meaning that we can get turbines installed much quicker than previously. Uh, we have better weather forecasting methods for, for planning things like marine operations. Uh, so you're more certain about when you can go out and fix your turbines. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing the emergence of remote and autonomous technologies uh, being used to do things like perform site surveys or inspect turbines. So that means that you, you don't need to send a crew out to, to do these tasks, uh, reducing both costs and risk as associated um, with, with those procedures. And, and lastly, one that I, I quite like, um, even virtual reality has found its applications in our sector. As an example, virtual reality is now being used to, to train offshore wind technicians before they, before they go offshore. So they, they know exactly what the problem is that they're, they're trying to fix before, before they go, go to site. And then they can do that procedure much, much, much quicker. So that leads me on quite nicely to, to the company that I work for. It's, um, I'm, what I work for the, company, uh, the, the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. We are the UK's leading technology innovation and research center for offshore renewables. Um, we're a not-for-profit not organization, uh, really with a purpose that is to accelerate the creation and growth of companies in our sector. And we do this in a number of ways, but primarily we're carrying out industrial research. Um, so taking innovations developed by innovators, uh, partnering them with industry and academia uh, to develop these into 
products and services uh, for our sector. And these are products and services that um, might be to reduce the, the cost and risk associated with renewable technologies, but ultimately it's you know, products and services that enable us to, to transition to a low carbon economy. Um, for the, the North American audience, I think perhaps the, the closest example I can give you is that um, we're, we're in similar in many ways to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the United States. And there are a number of uh, crossovers there. As an organization, we're, we're over 200. Um, primarily, we're you know, sort of technical experts in our field. Um, we operate various world leading test and demonstration facilities that I'll come on to in a second. As you can see from the map, we have uh, a number of offices around the UK. Uh, this is really a reflection of the fact that this is a UK wide industry, uh, perhaps not a surprise given that we're an island nation and are blessed with you know, fabulous marine renewable resources just about in, in every corner. Um, I personally work out of the office in Wales, uh, in Pembroke Dock, uh, so in South Wales. Um, our speciality is specifically marine renewables, and I'm, by that I mean wave and tidal technologies, as well as floating wind. Um, we have an office in the Humber on the east coast of the UK, for example, that's positioned strategically alongside an existing operations and maintenance supply chain on the east coast of the country uh, that feeds into the offshore wind developments that, that have taken place on the east coast. Um, so each, each of our offices has a, you know, a unique selling point, if you like, which is related to you know, the activity that's going on in, in that respective area. I mentioned that we, we have a number of uh, unique test facilities. Uh, I've highlighted just a few here to give you, give you a flavor. Um, we can test the, the largest wind turbine blades in the world. We have a 100 meter long uh, blade test facility where uh, we essentially strap a wind turbine blade uh, to a fixing in, in a warehouse and it can be subjected to the same conditions that that blade would experience in an operational real world environment. But we do this in, in the controlled environment of, of, of the laboratory. Uh, and you can also do things like accelerated testing as part of that, that program. Similarly, we have uh, powertrain test rigs. Um, again, you would use these for by and large the same purposes, accelerated testing and you know, replicating the conditions that that powertrain will experience in, in the field. Uh, we have powertrain test rigs for, for tidal and offshore wind turbines. We also operate our own offshore wind turbine. I'm going to provide a bit more detail about that in a second. Um, but other than our, our testing facilities, we're as a you know an organization primarily of technical experts, we, we can carry out a range of desk-based studies to, to help companies with innovations appraise those technologies. So that this ranges from things like you know, feasibility assessments, uh, kind of checking that you know what, what they're trying to do does what it says on the tin, or, or something like an economic assessment to, to help that company understand what the implications of the innovation will be on, on the costs of offshore renewables. So um, how much of a difference does it make to the levelized cost of energy? <clears throat> Increasingly, we're, we're also looking at, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of life cycle assessments these days. Um, there's increasing focus on uh, making the, the you know, we're, we operate in one of the, 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 the cleanest uh, industries, but the, there's always room for improvement. And um, increasingly, there's focus on you know, looking at the environmental impact of, of new technologies. Um, so that might include things like, you know, transitioning from offshore vessels that burn huge amounts of marine diesel to trying to, you know, encourage them to adopt hybrid propulsion uh, technology systems, for example. This is a snapshot of our offshore wind turbine that we own and operate. Uh, you'll see that it's um, offshore only just in nature. There is a, a bridge that connects it to the shore, um, but it is, you know, is a, a significant machine. It's capable of producing seven megawatts. Um, and it's a, a truly unique facility because 
We use this turbine um, to allow companies to come and test their technologies on the turbine. Um, so that might be you know, things like a new sensor that a company's developed for, for, for blades, or it might be uh, an inspection type, type technology. We've tested a range of drone and robotic type technologies in and around our turbine. Um, or it might even be um, that you know, we, a company needs data from an operational wind turbine. We provide them with data from our turbine to say, for example, validate a numerical model or, or to build a, a digital twin, for, for example. Truly unique because you wouldn't get that kind of access to, to any commercially operated offshore wind turbines, or you'd certainly struggle to. Um, so by, by owning and operating this machine and using it you know, in parallel with companies that want to de-risk technologies for the sector, um, you know, they, they wouldn't otherwise have that opportunity. Um, so if they can say that they've you know, tested their device on, on our machine, they're, they're much more likely then to be able to to make a commercial offering afterwards. We do also run a, a range of um, sort of more business support and commercialization type programs. Um, I've, I've highlighted just two uh, for now. The, the first one is one called Fit for Offshore Renewables. Uh, this is a program where we work with UK supply chain companies uh, to essentially upskill them such that they're ready to, to bid for work in our sector. Um, so we help them by you know, going through process to obtain relevant qualifications, for example, that they might be you know, a prerequisite to, to, to bidding for work in the sector. Uh, often these are companies that perhaps have come from another sector and have worked in the supply chain for that sector um, and know it inside out, but don't necessarily know what the requirements are, are for our sector. So we will, we will help them through that process through this program. Secondly, Launch Academy is more of a technology commercialize, commercialization type program where we'll work with companies that have near to the market type technologies and uh, we help them with a range of support to just push them over the hill to, the, to reach uh, full commercialization stage. So, that might include things like providing them with legal business case uh, and investor investor readiness type support, as well as things like uh, marketing support. And lastly, um, we also run innovation challenges very frequently uh, to identify solutions to, to challenges that industry is faced with. Typically, this will be something that's um, you know, sponsored by an industrial company. They'll come to us and say that we, you know, we have this problem. Can you help us find a, a solution to it? We'll we'll advertise the the challenge, um, and you know, invite applicants to come forward with their solutions, and then we'll help them develop those solutions, uh, such that we 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 solve solve this this problem. Uh, just just to give you an example, recently we ran one uh, for the tidal stream sector. Uh, which aim to you know, look at developing solutions to track marine species and marine mammals in and around tidal stream turbine farms. So that, in a nutshell, is kind of you know, a flavor of the type of thing that we do. Um, I would encourage anyone to, to visit our website to you know, look at specific case studies where we, we've worked with uh, companies in the past. Okay, thanks very much. And I'll happily ask, answer any questions at the end. Thank you, Magnus. That was very interesting. And I cannot emphasize how much of a wealth of knowledge the ORE Catapult website is um, for a variety of reports and information um, that draw on a lot of what Magnus has presented there. Um, I'm sure there'll be some questions that come through. I've seen there's a couple coming through on the Q&A, but just to remind everybody, if you can pop any into there, we will have a discussion session at the end. Um, without further ado, though, um, just so we can get to that discussion point, I will hand over next to Tony Wright from the Fundy Ocean Research Centre for Energy, Ocean Energy for Energy. Can't get my acronym right at all. Um, over at Force. Over to you, Tony. Okay, Jess, thank you very much. Uh, good day, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning, depending on where you're at internationally. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for the chance to say a couple of words today about force and the tidal energy kind of sector in Nova Scotia that's emerging. 
I think these types of conversations are critical in terms of uh, building collaborations and generally building a global sector because no one country can do this. It requires a global effort specifically to try and bring the cost of renewables down to something that's competitive with other forms of renewables. So um, let me just try and share my screen here. Um, give me a moment. Jess, can you see that all right? Is that coming through? Not uh, okay. yes. It's gone to the yeah. now. Great, thank you. Okay. So um, hopefully not talk for more than 10 minutes. I want to give folks a quick overview of what's happening in the east coast of Canada in Nova Scotia, a province within our great nation that's really focused on tidal stream development at the moment, but a broader eye towards marine renewable energy development uh, more generally. Uh, and the role that force plays is, as a bit of a catalyst to try and get things going to study the potential for this energy. Okay, so force, and I guess for our, our UK attendees, force is very similar, I think, in a way to EMEC in Scotland. Um, and force, we're a not-for-profit company that was established in 2009 with the goal of studying the potential for in-stream tidal energy in Nova Scotia. And with a combination of funding from our federal government, provincial government, and the founding private sector partners of FORCE, our mission is really twofold. One, which is to you know, operate a facility to demonstrate tidal energy, to reduce the barriers to entry, and to encourage innovators to come and demonstrate the technology, in-stream tidal technology to Nova Scotia. But second, it's the steward for the project. And what I mean by that is to make sure that we're adhering to environmental, to regulations, uh, consents, permitting aspects of the project along the way, promoting research related to understanding potential impacts um, and, and aspects of coexistence in terms of how this energy inserts itself into more traditional uses of the ocean environment. And then reporting publicly, because there's no point of, of doing the research if we can't share it uh, and, and work towards being transparent and sharing what we observe about the sector. And I think fundamental to FORCE's mission is really understanding what aspect, what niche can tidal energy play in a future electricity generation mix in this province. And for those that are unfamiliar with Nova Scotia, we're still heavily reliant on on coal and fossil fuels for electricity generation. So we have an urgent need to shift. Uh, and there's a lot of potential there for tidal energy to play a meaningful role in that. But there's still a lot of questions about what the exact role tidal energy can play. And really, I think it comes down to three main questions that need to be answered. Uh, the viability of the technology. So what, what is its redundancy? And what's the long-term cost projections for the cost of electricity from tidal? Second is how, how is this technology going to coexist with other users of our ocean waters? And is it safe? Is it safe for the environment? Isn't it safe for operators to be installing these types of devices? And we're certainly making a lot of headway in answering those questions. And particularly as, as I look across the world in areas that are developing marine renewables, we're starting to get some good answers to those questions, but there's still a lot of work to do. Okay, uh, Alisa gave a great overview of what's happening in Canada. I, I'm not gonna really touch on that too much because there's other things to say, except for the fact that marine renewable energy in Canada to date has really been focused on trying to understand in-stream tidal potential in the country, wave energy potential and river current potential. Uh, offshore wind is a relatively new thing for Canada in terms of uh, marine renewable energy potential to power um, the country. And, and that's pretty much a, uh, an issue because of, of the demand. We have such a land mass in Canada that moving towards offshore wind is seen as something of almost of a last resort. And it really becomes a question of why would we need to do that when there's so much on, onshore resources still available yet to be yet to be developed. Anyway, it, it's a good question. And it's something that I think Canada is trying to advance on and making the business case of why we should also look towards offshore wind as a potential solution for future energy needs. But, but the work we do and the focus in the province has really been on in-stream tidal energy. And I look back over, over our history as a province and this is nothing new. 
In fact, the investigation in stream tidal energy has, you know, goes back almost a hundred years when the first prototype uh, tidal energy device was installed and tested uh, in the Minas Channel by a company out of Acadia University, which is uh, in the province of Nova Scotia. In the 70s and 80s, there was a big push by our government to look at large scale garage site projects. Um, and the result of that work, a lot of that led by our Department of Fisheries and Oceans in terms of understanding what the potential impacts of that type of technology were, really resulted in uh, abandoning that as a priority for energy generation because the, the broad impacts of that large scale barrage type technology were too uncertain, especially in the Bay of Fundy and how that could impact the ecosystem and the physical oceanography of the Bay. And so what happened there was we had a demonstration facility constructed led by our utility Nova Scotia Power that saw the development of a 20 megawatt barrage style project in the Annapolis Valley. Uh, that's been in service since 19, you know, 19, late 1980s uh, and is, is about to be decommissioned. And you know, I think it's safe to say that there was a lot of community pushback from that style of energy generation because of the, of the impacts it was having on the local ecosystem and fish and fish habitat. And something I'm gonna talk a little bit later. And so very much in response to those issues, along comes in-stream tidal energy. And in-stream tidal energy, I think we all understand, you know, uh, operates uh, from the natural flow of ocean currents. It's designed to be scalable, it's designed to be removable, and, and ideally low impact. And that's a lot of the work that force needs to do is to demonstrate the low impact aspect of in-stream tidal energy. And so here's just a little example of the recent effort to push forward with in-stream tidal energy in the province dating back to like the 2010 era, era we had uh, no, uh, sorry, Open Hydro uh, demonstrate the first device in Canada. The other photographs here are Big Moon Power, which is a birth holder at Force and Sustainable Marine. Okay, so why is, why is Nova Scotia so interested in developing tidal energy and why is it really a hotbed internationally for in-stream tidal? It really comes down to three things in my mind. One is the, you know, the globally significant resource present in the Bay of Fundy. Two is um, the facility that's been created via force to help connect the resource to the transmission grid, something we don't find readily available internationally. And two is the policy and regulation support that's, that exists in Nova Scotia. So just to touch on that briefly, those that are not familiar with the Bay of Fundy, um, it's an amazing tidal energy resource. It's an amazing resource across the board for many different reasons. But from a tidal energy perspective, you know, force is located in the Minas Passage, which connects the Minas Basin to the remainder of the Bay of Fundy. And through this channel, it's estimated that there's about 7,000 megawatts power potential there, which exceeds the, Atlantic, the peak demand of Atlantic Canada. So the resource is immense. But what makes it such a great resource also makes it a challenging uh, uh, world to, to uh, challenging environment to work in. And, and hopefully we can hear a little bit more about that from uh, other presenters online, DP Energy and Nova Innovations. Okay, so the other aspect is the, the, the force facility, um, you know, designed as, as both host and steward, as I mentioned before, but significantly, you know, the intent here of, of building some of the facilities, some of the aspects of the project is to remove the barriers to entry and encourage development, encourage demonstration at the site. And to do that, we have five permanent berths offshore. Those berths connected to a 30 megawatt um, interconnection facility via 11 kilometers of subsea power cable. That interconnection, that interconnection facility connected to transmission uh, connection on the Nova Scotia grid. So without that facility, the resource becomes kind of like non-accessible. And if we look across Canada, there's a significant resource in Canada's north, but it's really not available for development at the moment because there's nothing we can do with the energy that's generated for now, okay? So the fact that we have this facility that you know, takes some of the risks away for developers, I think is a really important mechanism that's encouraged investment in Nova Scotia. And lastly, is the regulatory environment and the policy supports. Elisa touched on this already a little bit. No need to dive into it. It's not really the intent of this presentation. 
Um, but really, I think it comes down to two things. One is that there's public policy that's interested in the development of marine renewable energy. So that's number one, I think that's critical. And because there's that public policy, that the government has also gone towards creating a Marine Renewable Energy Act. And so there's legislation that creates a clear, transparent pathway for the development of this sector in, Can in, in Nova Scotia specifically. And so without that, a developer would be left to kind of assemble all the regulatory aspects of the project on their own, trying to get the attention of each individual government department. And it would be like a vertical uphill climb to try and try and make progress on that. The other thing that we have going for us in Nova Scotia at the moment is production incentive through a feed-in tariff program, where the government for these first demonstration projects is awarding um, 53 cents per kilowatt hour for the production of in-stream power energy. So those two things are really incenting activity at the site. Just to give folks a little bit of overview of the force site itself and our developers, uh, I said we have five permitted berths. Presently, Berth Bravo and Echo are awarded to DP Energy, and their plan is to install uh, Andrit's um, technology at those berths. I'll let Sarah uh, talk about that. Berth D is awarded to Big Moon Power. They have a floating technology, presently the first turbine being built in the province here today. Um, and we also have uh, Sustainable Marine with their floating plat high system, the 460 kilowatt system that is presently plan for development across Earth A and C. But this is not the only activity that we have in the province. And I'm really glad that John's uh, here to be able to talk about Nova Innovations Project. So I don't have to. But just to say that um, outside of the forest demonstration facility, we also have in the, in the province a demonstration program that allows for smaller projects to, to be developed in different jurisdictions within Nova Scotia waters. And so that's really attracted three developers that are all buying to demonstrate their technology. And we have the Nova Innovation Project down in a region uh, near Digby Neck, it's called. And then close to the forest site, we have two Canadian developers, uh, Jupiter Hydro and New Energy East, um, attempting to develop approximately two megawatt projects, uh, looking to interconnect through the forest site and develop those in concert with the other forest projects we have on the go. So in some total, a lot of activity on the go. It's really interesting times. Um, and for the rest of this, my, you know, hopefully a couple minutes, I want to touch on some of the work Forest does to try and work with the developers, work with stakeholders, work with the province to make sure that we develop this technology in a sustainable and safe manner. Okay, so understand the role in-stream tidal energy has in our energy future, it's really gonna come down to two things. Is it safe and can it coexist with other users of the Bay of Fundy? You know, our role as steward is to do a lot of work, to do the monitoring, to assess that and do a lot of the research, to try and bring new concepts, new methodologies to try and answer some of those really critical questions. And as, as I indicated before, there's absolutely no point of doing any of this work unless we share that information publicly. Because future decisions about marine renewable energy development or tidal development are not gonna be made by our developers, they're not gonna be made by force. It's gonna to have to have public support. And if the public and stakeholders that are interested in the development of the technology don't have the answers to critical questions about potential impacts, what does a large scale development look like? What does that mean for the ecosystem? It's just not going to happen. And so we've got to make that in, we have to make that information publicly available. Okay. Part of our part of forces environmental consent requires us to do specific studies on fish, marine mammals, noise, lobsters, and seabirds. But that's just the beginning. That's just answering some basic questions about potential impacts on those species. A lot of work is yet to be done in terms of, of really being able to assess what the impact of some of these technologies are on fish and fish habitat, for instance. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you an example here of a project that we're collaborating on. This is not forces project, it's a team of partners trying to advance uh, the ability to develop acceptable encounter rate modeling for devices in, in the minus channel. And specifically what we're trying to do is assess the co-occurrence probability of a fish and a turbine being in the same spot to put some boundary conditions upon the potential for risk and impacts. Because right now it's a blank slate. There is 
a lot of uncertainty out there, scientific, a lack of scientifically credible data about the impacts on fish. And in Canada, it's a big issue for us because we have two pieces of legislation that really oversee the um, fish and marine habitat. And that would be the Canadian Fisheries Act and the Species at Risk Act that essentially um, make it describe the fact that developers are not allowed to kill or harm fish or to have any negative impact on fish habitat. And so the scientific evidence to support that is really not there today in terms of going beyond single devices and into larger scale development. So we have to find a way to do this. So one of the approaches that we're taking is to combine broad spatial assessment of flow, because we know that the flow regime and wave regime impacts fish and marine mammal behavior. And then we're looking at data that's been curated by the Ocean Tracking Network at Dalhousie that has over 10 years of tag detection data of different species from this area. And so really combining those two data sets, we're trying to make a fish forecast map. And I'll just show you what that looks like. So for a specific species in the minus channel, so this is the forest area, the minus passage, the forest permitted areas, the box in blue. This is really a preliminary fish forecast map of striped bass. This I think was um, August, August 17th, six in the morning. This is the probability of detecting striped strike bass in the forest area in a 150 meter by 150 meter grid pattern throughout the channel. And really what this information is telling us is the presence probability that striped bass will be here. And if we know where the turbines are going to be installed, we can assess the probability that specific amount of striped bass are gonna be in the region uh, and, it's, and assess the encounter rate likelihood, essentially, that striped bass and turbines will be in the area. And the goal here, you know, is to, is to put some boundary conditions on the risk. So if, if we know uh, striped bass, inner Bay of Fundy striped bass or Bay of Fundy striped bass is a special designation in SARA, a Species at Risk Act. And so we have to have some scientifically credible information that talks about, you know, the potential for harm from striped bass populations in the minus passage Getting species specific information is a really challenging thing to, to do from tidal environments. And this is one approach where we can finally have a conversation about what is the potential risk. Hopefully, it's going to be low about tidal energy development towards strike bass populations. Okay. Th this is just an example of some of the work we do. And it's critical because one of the most significant barriers in our minds for the development of this sector is a lack of regulatory certainty as the, as the technology, as these projects build out. It's, it's fine, we're in the demonstration phase now, individuals, uh, companies are looking to demonstrate the first technology. In some cases, you know, they have a, a, a phase one to install three or five devices, and, and that's good. We need that, we need, the, we need that kind of work to inform you know, on, on what are the potential impacts and how do we need to go about uh, regulating this and what do stakeholders think of these projects. But beyond that, how does this industry unfold? And for these technologies in Canada's oceans, there's a lot of uncertainty about what are the regulatory requirements going to look like for broader scale adoption of this technology. And it's something that we have to work on. And a key piece of that in my mind is providing scientifically credible data to our regulators about potential effects something that is lacking today. Okay. Lastly, um, community participation and engagement. I think it's something that's often overlooked. You know, I'm an engineer by nature, enthralled by the technology, love working in the ocean, but not everybody shares that view. And I think that's something that we always have to recognize is that Bay of Fund, whether it's the Bay of Fundy or the Pentland Firth or, or the ocean environment in general, it means a lot and it means different things to different stakeholders. And so us looking to develop renewable energy from this resource really need to consider that and need to consider the different points of view out there because not everybody is in, loves what we're doing. And so we need to understand what those concerns and the way we can, we, we need to first understand those concerns and then address those. Because right now, I don't think you can make a case that marine renewable energy does not require public support and government support 
to get beyond this demonstration, commercial demonstration phase that we're at today. So just, I just wrote down a couple of points as Magnus was talking here that I think are really important for us to understand as a sector in that we need to continue to work on our engagement and building stakeholders and community into the projects in a meaningful way so that we can transparently share what we're learning uh, with those that are interested in the, in the development of this technology. And specifically, we need to make sure at all times that this sector aligns with pu public policy objectives, you know, whether that's uh, generating electricity for remote communities or a decarbonization agenda, we always need to make sure that what we're doing is in lockstep with government policy. There also has to be clear conversation about local and regional benefits for this, because it just, I don't think it's gonna gain public acceptance if there's not concrete identified benefits of what we're doing in the communities in which we're operating. We need to have an environment of transparency in terms of sharing progress, sharing what we're learning, and that includes the good and the bad. And, and I think that it's really important to be honest about some of the things that are not going quite right. And with that, then we can turn the discussion in terms of how to fix those problems and then building collaborations and partnership around that. We need to have, we need to exhibit confidence in our ability to monitor for potential impacts. Right now, this environment, I mean, in stream tile specifically, it's operating in some of the world's most challenging environments. So collecting meaningful data, scientific data, is really difficult. But until we do that, we're not going to have an ability to create confidence, both in the regulators and stakeholders, that they need to have to get support to keep going. And then again, coexistence with other users of the ocean, and particularly in Canada, uh, we need to really focus on what, what this type of technology means for our fishing sector, and probably more importantly, what it means for First Nations and their kind of use of this ocean, how they regard this, this natural resource. So it's something that we can never forget is that we always need to be working with stakeholders and rights holders to make sure we can work alongside these other more traditional users of our oceans. And I think that's it for now. Um, looking forward to any questions after everyone's finished speaking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. That was a very interesting and insightful presentation. Um, there are a number of points I've drawn on as well. And I think, you know, your uh, that there's a few questions that have come in, particularly around the environmental um, sort of understanding and monitoring that's underway. And I, I do think that there's a lot of learning that can be taken from one side of the Atlantic to the other um, and vice versa. And, and I think probably to, to reassure some of our listeners probably is happening to some extent. So I know my colleague Jay has just uh, shared the OES um, state of science report, which looked at some of the key issues that we see and where the learning has demonstrated minimal impact and where there's still areas that we need to work on. Um, and, but we, we'll look Loop back to that I'm sure in in the question and answer at the end in the meantime I'm hoping hopeful that um, John will actually be able to talk about some of Nova's experience in the Shetlands because I know that they've had quite a lot of success with um, capturing data particularly interactions with turbines of some of our more marine species so I'd be very interested to see if you can cover that off as well John um, not to want to change your remit in any way shape or form but I'll hand over to you now if that's all right of course, Jess. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chrysler. Um, welcome, everybody, uh, and thank you for this opportunity to, sp to speak today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, um, just to make sure you can see that okay. Okay, that should be... You see that okay? Thank you, John. Right, sorry, I forgot the beginning. Right, okay. So um, this is all about. Um, so what I'll do, Jess, is uh, we'll cover that question towards the end. But um, I'll just walk through the slides to be to begin with, if that's okay. Great. So thank you. Um, so when we're looking at scaling up for international development, so just to begin with, um, this slide here shows basically the benefits of of, of tidal energy. So spot the power station. Uh, one of the great things is is it's there's no visual impact in the landscape, and so that bodes very well. And and essentially, I know other technologies struggle with that, uh, but uh, yeah, Nova's tidal turbines are sit on the seabed, hidden from view, so they're clean, uh, predictable. There's no visual impact. They do not affect shipping. Uh, they're unaffected by storms, 
and they are environmentally friendly. And what we're hoping to do here is replicate this uh, in other parts of the world. So this is this is actually Blue Moor Sound in Shetland, and uh, this is the world's first offshore tidal array, which has been running for more than five years now. So this is what the turbines look like. So um, 100 kilowatt units, um, a probe and technology. Um, so we, we've had three turbines in the water for, for uh, more than five years. Uh, and this is our new direct drive turbine, which is actually installed in 2020. That's been running for over a year now. And it's, um, it's been performing really, really well. So the, the key difference between the original three and this one is that uh, this does not have a gearbox. Uh, so it's uh, more efficient, uh, it's more reliable, and um, we're getting uh, better performance with higher energy output as well. So it's, um, and this is the, the, the turbine, which we're going to be sort of um, technology we're going to use in Canada as well in our petite passage project. Uh, now these are scalable, um, so we can actually uh, flat pack them, uh, put them into shipping containers and, and ship them anywhere around the world. Uh, they're scalable, so you can install a single turbine or multiples to form megawatt arrays. And uh, this has been developed on the back of our um, uh, innovation and in R&D, which we completed in our D2T2 project, which is direct drive technology uh, on FAT in Shetland. So what we're doing there is doubling the size of the array from three turbines to six turbines. But crucially, we are also learning an immense amount about the tidal resource. Uh, and in that project, we're actually going to be repositioning some of those turbines, moving them closer together so we can identify the optimal spacing between the turbines, which is really going to help with um, energy uh, intensity and, and density. So, yeah, so very exciting with lots of computer models, but um, they've not been re repositioned in the real world environment. And then the, the latest uh, suite in the innovation is artificial intelligence and that's in our uh, element project uh, and that's really going to optimize the control of the turbines as well so moving on to our uh, we've called this our sort of blue energy islands um so we've we've got the um isle of yale there in, in in shetland in scotland four operational turbines that's increasing to six uh, in the middle there we have our, our Pity passage project uh, which is adjacent to, to long island uh, that's for 15 turbines um, for, for 1.5 megawatts. Uh, the first turbine there is 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 uh, going to be deployed in early 2022, uh, and we're, we're using a phased approach there. So the the first turbine, um, and then we'll, we'll get gain learning from that. We'll understand the characteristics of the particular site, uh, and then uh, getting sort of de-risking any sort of um, technical or environmental or uh, financial aspects, uh, and then we'll then roll out to phase 1B, which will be the four other turbines, and then we'll, we'll plan to move on to phase two and phase three um, at a later stage. Uh, in, in Wales there on the right, you see our Onisenkli uh, project, um, so that's the five turbines. Um, so we started our um, surveys on the site there after securing funding from, from WEFO, that was ERDF funding, and uh, we're hoping to have the first turbine uh, operational in 2022 or 2023. Now, just show you a little bit of animation. Um, so this was uh, recently um, used in our, the Tidal Power Express, uh, but it's really powerful uh, in just kind of showing you the site there uh, in Bardsey Island, uh, in Yosengli. Um, This is a site in, in Wales. So we're looking to really try and form a blue energy island there. And similarly uh, in Nova Scotia, uh, just down to uh, Petit Passage there. So it just gives you some perspective of what those sites look like. Uh, now, I'll just move on. Um, so this is this is showing our um, international portfolio of projects. Um, so we're just we're just starting Wales there. So I'll just show you the animation of uh, Onisenkli. Uh, as well as that, we were also a birth holder at More Light, More Lights, the demonstration zone uh, in Canada. Uh, we talked about uh, Petit Passage. Um, Tony has, has talked about the huge potential in the Bay of Fundy and, uh, you know, at the foresight and, and in other areas. So Canada really is, is a huge, huge potential market. Um, so we are hoping that when we install our first turbine, uh, that's really going to act as a kind of real um, uh, 
uh, inflection point for um, confidence and growth in the sector. Uh, if we turn to Scotland, uh, we talked about the Shetland Tidal Array. Uh, we also have a project in the west coast of Scotland, the Isla project. And that's very exciting because there's, there's a potential there to um, produce whiskey distilled by the tide. Um, so watch this space. So we'll see how it all pans out. And then we have France. So we're doing our testing on the elements uh, project uh, in, in French waters. And France, again, has a huge potential for tidal energy. So we've got a number of opportunities there as well. Uh, and yesterday, we were delighted to announce funding for our um, uh, project in Indonesia. So we've secured funding from the Innovation Agency in the UK, so it's uh, Innovate UK, uh, and that's to undertake a feasibility study in Indonesia. Uh, so that's for seven megawatts, uh, and that's really to look at the potential, um, potential there. Indonesia in itself is a very, very exciting place. It's made up of 17,000 islands with um, uh, water flowing between two oceans. So yeah, the potential there is, is, is vast. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so that's kind of an update in terms of where we're at, um, in terms of our scaling and, and growth internationally. Um, so I'm just mindful of time. Um, so just want to say uh, and, and thank you. Uh, and I'm happy to field any questions um, that are asked. Um, so either at the end or, uh, or now, just whichever suits. Um, we can probably loop back to John. I think we can probably go around the panel and collectively talk about um, questions that have come in. Um, that was very, very interesting. I uh, particularly enjoyed your animations. I think there's a lot to be said for pictures painting a thousand words and you do begin to get a real sense for the sort of uh, the the opportunity, particularly for the blue energy island that we've got up in um, Anacentli, because taking that diesel generation away from them and, and giving them a clean power solution that's completely invisible, um, but yet they're there and, and doing the job that they need is uh, a very good opportunity. So thank you. Um, just a reminder to anybody, if you've got any questions for John, if you can pop them into the Q&A, um, we will pick them up in the discussion, which will follow our final presentation from DP Energy. I'm not actually sure who's going first from DP, um, so I will hand over to Sarah and Bethan to um, invite them to present, if you could, please. John, if you can stop sharing your screen, please. Right. Oh, thanks, Jess. I was just going to yeah, ask if I could uh, share screen. So that's brilliant. Just bear with me two seconds while I get the presentation up and ready to go. Fab, can you see that OK? Not oh. yet, but. Is that showing? Nope. Um, hold on. There oh, we go. There we go. Perfect. Just make it full screen. Pap, is that looking okay? It is indeed. Thank you very much. Over to you. Great. Thanks, Bethan. Um, so I will start for the presentation today from DP Energy. Um, so uh, hand it off to uh, Bethan to talk about um, DP Energy's activities in Wales, and then she and I uh, will uh, jointly talk about opportunities to uh, learn from uh, either jurisdiction and then some of the challenges, common challenges between jurisdictions. Um, sorry, thank you, Bethan. <laughs> so um, I'm Sarah Thomas. I'm the project manager for DP Energy's uh, tidal turbine project here in the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia, Canada. Go ahead, next slide, Bethan, please. So DP Energy has been developing renewable energy projects uh, around the world, um, solar, wind, offshore wind, uh, tidal, um, floating wind, um, any and all renewable energy projects are really uh, things that DP Energy takes a look at. Uh, next slide, please. We have projects uh, around the globe. Um, uh, Australia um, had some really big projects. Um, handover in the last uh, year or two there, a lot of activity in the UK and Ireland. And then here in Canada, DP Energy has been operating for over 20 years in Canada specifically um, from wind projects, um, a number of solar projects out west, and then the tidal turbine project here in the Minas Passage. Next slide, please. So Canada, as Elisa has talked about and Tony alluded to as well, there are a number of resources uh, for marine renewables um, in 
throughout Canada. Um, I'll just go over some, some uh, information and, and maps that are available from the Government of Canada that just highlight some of the resource areas. So this shows the, the wind resource area, offshore wind resource areas in Atlantic Canada specifically. Um, next slide. And tidal um, energy resources that uh, would be available um, around Nova Scotia specifically. Um, so this slide, as it shows there, uh, just shows the, the power that could be extracted if the currents through these specific areas were, uh, if the volume of water was reduced just by 5%. So that shows the, the um, huge potential for tidal energy uh, here in Nova Scotia. Um, one of the key things with tidal in Nova Scotia is the province um, is committed to its uh, marine energy strategy from 2015, where they are committed to you know, 300 megawatts of, of power from the tidal uh, sector specifically. And so that's still something that um, the province hopes to uh, achieve in the future. Next slide, please. So. Um, Looking outside of Atlantic Canada, this uh, just shows some other areas where there's tidal current potential around Canada. So up north and then uh, on the west coast as well, um, a smaller but still still resource areas. Um, and next slide. And WAVE, um, not something that uh, we've explored too much here, but again, there is a possible um, potential for WAVE energy projects around Canada as well. Um, next slide. Okay, so DP Energy in Canada, as I said, um, DP Energy has been operating projects in Canada for over 20 years. Um, currently, we have solar projects that are active um, in Alberta, uh, but marine energy wise, we have our tidal turbine project here in the Bay of Fundy. Um, which is highlighted there on the graphic. Um, we are exploring offshore wind opportunities in Atlantic Canada and elsewhere. Um, hopefully the um, offshore energy regulation that Elisa mentioned, um, hopefully that federal regulation will be the first stepping stone in the federal government um, developing some sort of um, funding regime or feed-in program for offshore wind. Um, similar to the, uh, the feed-in tariff program that Nova Scotia has for tidal. It would be great to see the province also develop some sort of um, uh, funding regime for offshore wind, um, not just the federal government, but um, there's a lot of work to be done for uh, us to get there. Um, so that's what no uh, DP Energy is doing here in Canada specifically. I'm gonna turn it over to Beth to talk about DP Energy and Wales, and then uh, we'll come back together to talk about joint challenges and um, opportunities to learn from each other. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I'm Beth and Symes. I'm the project development manager here in the UK team. Um, so we're based in Southwest Wales in Pembrokeshire in the Marine Energy Wales hub. Um, so looking at our activity then sort of across the pond from from Canada. So as Jess uh, ran through earlier, uh, Wales has got some uh, brilliant resources. Um, there is quite significant tidal resource in the north, we've got good wave resource, and we'll come on to wind resource a bit later on. Uh, so the purpose of the team in the UK is to develop projects here, as well as sort of identify new markets, uh, bringing new projects on board. Um, so like I said, Wales is perfectly positioned for offshore renewables. Uh, there's brilliant resources, we've got a really supportive political landscape and a great supply chain as well. So in terms of our activity then, so we're tidal stream, we're investigating tidal stream opportunities at Morlice on the back of the recent AR4 CFD announcement uh, that John mentioned earlier, that sort of 20 million RIN fence to develop tidal stream here in the UK. Um, we're also interested in tidal range and we're participating in the Welsh Government Tidal Lagoon Challenge um, and just interested in tidal range opportunities here in Wales. And we've also got interest looking at hydrogen, so we're investigating opportunities for hydrogen as an alternative offtake arrangement. Uh, so in terms of, uh, as well as Wave and Tidal, Wales also has a fantastic offshore wind resource. So the Celtic Sea surrounding Wales, Ireland and the Southwest uh, has high average wind speeds, typically above uh, eight metres per second, um, and water depths of 
over 50 metres. So Wales wasn't able to benefit from the fixed offshore winds uh, that we've seen on the East Coast due to how deep our waters are offshore. Uh, but floating offshore winds then unlocks this renewable source of energy generation. So DP has been exploring floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea for some time. So we are developing our Gwint Glass floating offshore wind farm. So this came about because UK and Welsh government um, are really supportive of floating wind. They've set some um, key targets of achieving one gigawatt by 2030. Um, and the Crown Estate are also seeking opportunities to sort of achieve uh, the best value, but the lowest impact net zero targets. So there's potentially 50 gigawatts um, available in the Celtic Sea, and that would look at creating almost 30,000 jobs here in the UK with about 43.6 billion um, pounds coming into the UK uh, gross value added. So it can really help boost industry in some of these coastal regions in Wales and the Southwest um, and the West of Ireland uh, that are sort of in need of that economic regeneration. So like I said, we're working on Gwint Glass. So our phase one is for 300 megawatts. So we're looking at a site about 70 kilometers offshore um, and we started some aerial environmental surveys and uh, have secured a grid connection. So we're still at very early stages of site identification uh, and design, and we're looking to design this project to capture economic, environmental and social values. So economic values in terms of maximizing regional supply chain, uh, environmental values through providing green energy uh, to about 300,000 homes for phase one and social value through education and uh, through our community engagement, really focusing on sort of inclusivity and tackling inequality in some of the sort of more disadvantaged coastal regions. We are also now since the Crown Estate announcement a few weeks ago, where they've identified a four gigawatt leasing round and now looking at a phase two to this project of an additional 700 megawatts. Uh, so in terms of international site development, then uh, we've heard from a number of speakers today, sort of highlighting some of the common challenges. Um, so to echo some of what we've already discussed, uh, you know, some of these areas that we're looking at in terms of uh, wave and tidal and floating offshore wind are quite challenging areas to operate in. Uh, it's really good resources, uh, but that then does mean that it's quite difficult operating uh, terrain. Uh, typically then that can cause uh, some incidents. So sometimes the cost of marine interventions are quite high. Um, so working at sea is, is quite costly. Uh, some of these areas that we're looking at are quite remote areas and they've got limited shore-based infrastructure and similarly some limited supply chain support available. So sometimes you're looking at uh, higher increased mobilization uh, charges in terms of vessels to get that supply chain uh, that you need on site. Uh, I think we've heard today about sort of grid limitations on capacity, and I think that's a challenge on, on both sides of the ponds. So uh, the stability concerns, capacity in general, um, and sort of that uh, issue of offtake. Um, on both sides, then there's some uncertainty of seabed leases. Um, obviously now with the Crown Estate announcement for the Celtic Sea in terms of floating offshore wind, um, in Wales as well, there's also some wave and tidal demonstration sites that have already been identified by the Crown Estate. Um, and obviously over in Canada then, FORCE um, provides some uh, ready, readily available leased areas to go into. As we've heard already, consenting in a marine environment is quite challenging. Uh, there's still some knowledge and evidence gaps. Um, and also sometimes there's... Uh, it's a bit of a challenge dealing with multiple regulators as well in order to um, achieve those consents. So then you've got marine planning in terms of other uses in the sea. Um, 
you know, there's quite a lot of shipping and navigation, as well as other recreational users and designated environmental areas that we need to take into account when we're looking at developing sites. Um, and going back to the cost of working at sea and some of the sort of in marine uh, interventions and issues that then sort of drives prices with insurance. Uh, so common challenges across the pond, um, but I think where there are then opportunities to learn uh, from each other, um, there's a number that we could look at taking forward. Um, so in terms of risk characterization for consenting, uh, it's already been spoken about today in terms of taking those lessons learned from the UK um, and bringing that across to Canada. And I know FORCE then is looking to sort of progress other uh, research projects um, and vice versa, then that can come back to the UK. I think it would be quite important to establish a sort of formal lessons learned process and industry best practices um, across sort of Canada and the UK and, and worldwide. Uh, so we've got some best practices to, uh, to follow and that will hopefully then drive down some of the operating costs and insurances. Um, like I said, we've we've had quite good success recently with now the national revenue support uh, in the tidal industry, tidal stream industry. Um, and I think trying to take some of those lessons into Canada in terms of how how to set that up and also how to have that engagement with uh, politicians and regulators to move that forward. Uh, community engagement is needed uh, internationally when you're developing sites. Um, so I feel like we can learn from each other in terms of best practices and, and what will, works well and what doesn't. Um, where we've said a grid is a challenge, um, there's definitely an opportunity, I think, for Wales and Canada to then look at becoming net exporters of energy. Um, so looking at how we can take uh, the energy produced uh, by our brilliant resources and export that uh, globally, um, be that through hydrogen or um, other forms of energy storage. Um, and I think then sort of industry association, associations working together then to share knowledge and experience and look at solving those collective problems as well as promoting collaboration. So we see that here today with uh, Marine Energy Wales and Marine Renewables Canada uh, working really well together and sort of facilitating events like today as well as that sort of cross-border collaboration. Uh, Sarah, can I just come back to you to see if there's any Anything else you'd like to add on the challenges and, and the opportunities? No, I, I mean, you covered them and, um, you know, it's really good to see that a lot of these were also brought up by, by everyone else earlier today. And so, you know, it's good that, that we've identified some of the common challenges and, and good ways for us to continue to work together to, to solve some of those challenges. So looking forward to that. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks, Sarah. So yeah, so I think there's already a really good relationship established between Wales and Canada. Uh, we saw last week that Welsh government had a really good presence at the MRC conference. Um, this event today is proof that we can come together and collaborate and hopefully we can see that moving forward. Um, so I think I'll leave it there and uh, hand back to you, Jess, uh, for the Q&A, if that works. That does indeed. Thank you very much, Beth. Good presentation and some, um, yeah, very good reinforcement of some of the points that have come up with the other um, panellists and participants. So thank you very much for the summary. Um, I think that there's been a few fairly common themes that have come up over and over again. And one that I, I've noted in the Q&A in the chat is around supply chain and I suppose sort of skills diversification and opportunity for people um, to I suppose capitalize on the economic opportunity, um, but I suppose th there's a secondary benefit there in terms of your engagement with local communities. So I was potentially gonna come to some of our panelists. I'll, I'll maybe see if there's volunteers to begin with, and if not, I'll uh, spot check you um, just to see how you're um, working both in Canada and in Wales with um, your respective projects. And I suppose this is specifically to Nova and, and to DP to make sure that the local people can benefit from the economic um, opportunity and how they can potentially diversify to support business if indeed you're intending to use local supply chain or if you're intending to maintain it within the domestic region. Um, so first, Beth, as you're on screen, should we come to you to begin with? 
Yeah, sure, I can take that. So um, we're really early stages with our Gwint Glass project. Um, so don't have anything tangible in terms of activity that we're currently doing. But what we are looking at is, yeah, maximizing that supply chain uh, value here in, in Wales and the UK. So we are part of a Celtic Sea Developers Alliance um, and sort of working together with that alliance of developers and also a recently formed Celtic Sea Cluster to look at how we can maximise that supply chain benefit. So I think in terms of flipping it round on its head, I think we need to look at what we need to provide to supply chain uh, to give them the sort of pipeline of projects that they need to make those investment decisions in order to then be able to supply these industries. Uh, so that's one thing that we're looking at with ports and supply chain here at the minute. Um, in terms of communities, uh, I think it's quite important to sort of explain to them uh, why why it's here, why this area. Um, there's a lot of people that are quite supportive of renewable energy, um, but sometimes they don't quite understand why it's being developed in a particular area. So explaining uh, why these sites are suitable and how then that community can get involved. So be that through uh, education uh, from primary school or through to secondary and beyond in terms of the opportunities for uh, careers in this industry, um, as well as um, other sort of more community aspects um, where we can try to pull in uh, more benefits to some of those disadvantaged areas. Sarah, have you got anything to add from our Canada side? Yeah, thank you. Um, so with our turb uh, tidal turbine project, our, our community and stakeholder engagement is, is currently ongoing. So, so we're actually in the midst of discussions with the local communities and, and the local uh, stakeholders to make sure that we're, we're actually receiving their, their concerns and, and um, letting, letting them uh, express what their concerns are, what they hope to get from the project so that that can be incorporated into some of our, our um, development and, and what we're working on. A few of the, the areas where there's a huge potential for local community involvement are actually around um, implementing uh, our environmental monitoring and having participation and developing a pipeline for, um, you know, teaching um, uh, people how to actually work with and analyze the different data and, and building a, a pipeline of, of, of um, technicians that can actually be involved in the monitoring program and monitoring projects to, um, you know, help us uh, help the community to um, develop the, the tidal turbine projects here. And then long term, as, as the province and, and hopefully the country uh, are able to transition from developmental projects into commercial projects, um, once there's that, that um, uh, vision and, and that the, you know, solid projects um, pipeline, as, as Beth mentioned, uh, to actually get to a commercial project, then there's, there's a much more potential to develop supply chain um, in Nova Scotia and throughout Canada. Um, and John probably has some he can add to that about Nova um, and their, their progress. I was going to come to John next potentially and then I thought potentially if we could come to Elisa um, I suppose from a, an equivalent organization to MEW in Canada how are you working um, to support uh, SMEs in particular they're mentioned within the chat but the supply chain more generally but we'll come to Elisa after John. John you've obviously got um, experience on, on both sides of the pond and, 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 and the thoughts about how supply chain um, are, are developing in support of your organization and your deployments. Um, how can businesses get involved and, and how do you see that um, unfolding as, as deployments progress? That's a very good question. Um, and I guess the example of that is our Shetland Tidal Array, where um, during the development of that, 25 of the sort of project costs were within Shetland itself. Um, so that was, um, that was great for the local community, lots of uh, local companies were involved. Uh, an example would be uh, the blades for our turbines uh, were actually developed by a boat builder in, uh, in Shetland who um, expanded his business and grew and has since supplied all the blades for our turbines. So it's a, it's a great story of a homegrown um, company um, expanding um, uh, and growing in a sustainable industry and internationally as well. So, so that's that's a sort of local example. Um, within Scotland, um, we've got our um, main manufacturing facility 
Uh, we've secured funding uh, this year to, to expand that. Um, and, and with that is going to be opportunities for the local supply chain, um, not just in terms of manufactured components, but also in the services. So um, even using Wales as an, ex as an example, uh, we have been using um, the expertise at Bangor University. Um, there's some really uh, excellent no knowledge there in, in Bangor University when it comes to marine, especially on the environmental side. Um, then um, even undertaking um, uh, the surveys uh, using local vessels. Uh, in fact, one of the challenges we found in, in uh, Unisenkli is the availability of vessels to undertake uh, the activities that require. Um, so that I think is, is, is a challenge um, for us in, in Wales and something which we're uh, looking to try and address as soon as we can. Um, there, are, there are lots of um, opportunities and part of it, I think is gonna be a combination of public um, private partnership to identify the uh, challenges and, uh, and, and the gaps and how the, they could be filled. Uh, in, in, and in, in Canada, um, again, we are, it's been a bit of an unusual situation because of COVID. Um, we were looking to uh, do more across in Canada, but the restrictions of Canada and see what we can do. Um, so we've, we've done, um, uh, in order to keep the project moving along, uh, we, we've actually um, produced more content in Scotland, uh, but for the, for the additional turbines in the future, providing the, the uh, first turbine goes to plan, uh, there'll be more um, co local content within Canada. But we are we are actually engaged with using local contracts in Canada uh, who are assisting us with the assembly, uh, the installation. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, so the things are, um, there's lots of lots of involvement from, from both sides of the Atlantic. And for placing those contracts, John, are you using an organisation um, like MRC? So going through Elisa and her um, network to, to sort of promote the activities that are underway. I'm just thinking if we've got some of the, the participants in the, in the audience uh, wondering how they engage, is that the best route for them? That's how sort of MEW was, is hoping to proceed, particularly with the Celtic Sea Cluster, which um, Beth mentioned there. So what route do you use to um, secure those contracts? or, or advise about them. Yes, so, so, so we've got, we, we know MRC, um, uh, we've got contacts within Canada, uh, we have competitive tenders um, where, we, where we try and get um, uh, the, the best value for money uh, for, 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 for tidal energy. The challenge we've got is that with any sort of new energy technology, the cost is initially more expensive. And this is all about, um, you know, so tidal is more expensive than, than gas or more established forms of renewable of, um, energy technology. But we are, we are focused on driving the cost down. And so it's about it's, it's striking that balance um, to, 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 to enable us to do that. We are, we've actually found the vessel costs uh, more expensive in, in Canada than what they are in the UK. And so that's something that we're looking at um, to try and address as well. Super. Um, I, I would just a, a thought that has occurred to me is the synergies that we see in Wales between floating offshore wind and, and wave and tidal coming through subsequently is that we're hoping, particularly on the West Coast, where you've seen best presentation, the Celtic Sea developments coming um, forward probably faster than we'll see wave and tidal. Actually, we'll see the supply chain begin to develop in support of that. And then those synergies are then available with hopefully lesser costs to some of the other technologies to facilitate it. Um, uh, Elisa, I wondered if, um, from an MRC point of view, you had anything to add? Um, I mean, I think we probably do really similar things to what Marine Energy Wales is doing. So we've been working on um, commissioning market studies that would help suppliers understand what the opportunity looks like. Um, we've held supplier workshops in the past, just educating uh, suppliers on the opportunities. Um, and then we also created a supply chain database. So any company can in Canada can sign up for that. And that's something that we direct developers to. I think one of the key things out of all of that is, um, it, you know, in addition to that is that we've also partnered with communities and municipalities. So for example, like I know Terry Thibodeau from municipality of Digby's on this, and we've worked really closely with that community. And I think that 
that helps a lot because then the municipality stays up to date with what's going on and they can work with their constituents and people in that community. Um, but I, I would say, you know, the key thing has been striking a balance between education to suppliers um, while not raising expectations. And that can be really challenging when we're at this stage in the industry. And so we've been really careful with how we go about, you know, communicating what the opportunities are. But still at this time, what we we're seeing at least is, um, you know, more and more companies that have been working in oil and gas um, becoming members and are just trying to educate themselves and learn about what the opportunities are. And so I think that's really the, the starting point is just to be able to find the companies that, you know, could use the information, have the skills and just keep in communication and dialogue with them. Very much so. I think that's an observation we'd have from Wales as well. Um, the, the timelines that we're talking about, um, particularly with the CFDs that um, we've had announced for, for both floating wind and tidal, it's it's a, a, a between a four and a seven year lead in. So, so managing supply chain expectation just to ensure that they're aware that that pipeline is there and they're also aware that there will be investment required to support it, but doing it in a sustainable way and, and garnering that knowledge in the meantime to, to know what that opportunity looks like how they can diversify um, and take that forward um, I, so just to stay on supply chain for one more question um, Richard Carsten has asked how we accelerate the development of supply chain and cost reductions for tidal um, given that we won't see the tens to hundreds of gigawatts projects we see in wind I think to some extent I've sort of hopefully potentially answered that with some of the um, synergies that I see coming through from flow presenting opportunities and I think Elise probably touched on it there where you've got oil and gas diversifying from um, a, a robust foundational knowledge but I did wonder if uh, Magnus from the catapult would have any comment on um, uh, the development of supply chain and cost reductions for tidal specifically? Um, I think you've, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head, to be honest, Jess. Um, I mean, there, there are other industries as well, there are maritime industries where some of these technologies have applications to um, aquaculture is becoming an important thing too. So. Some of those supply chain technologies are applicable to all of these sectors, not just not just specifically tidal. So, um, and I think I think those are some of the best innovations as well, if they are, you know, multi multi-purpose type technologies. Um, so I think you know we're certainly trying to increase awareness of, of other opportunities for, for companies as well, not just in floating wind or or tidal stream, for for example. Super. Thank you, Magnus. Um, so I touched on it previously, um, and I think it's probably a good time to loop back to it. Just the environmental considerations that, that we're seeing coming through um, is quite a common theme. Again, um, I, it's a little bit di more difficult to manage because it's coming through in both the chat and the Q&A. Um, but, uh, you know, there's there's been questions asked about taking learning from the UK and from other project deployments that have um, been successful. And I, I touched on uh, Nova's deployment in, in the Shetland Isles and the, the level of data that's available for device interactions with some of the marine species. And I wondered if, um, well, John, probably Tony, I suspect could be fairly well informed about where, where that data is coming through. I think from a Welsh point of view, we've obviously um, we've not seen that many deployments as yet, but we do have the more ice um, demonstration zone, which will see a raise of devices going in, which will facilitate that collective understanding of multiple devices and how they interact with species. But um, John, I think your experiences in Shetland probably provide a robust foundation for that. Um, is there any comment you'd add? We've, we've shared in the chat the um, state of the science report from OES um, and advised that, but there's also questions around whether or not there's a central repository for data um, that's available. Um, and so I'm hoping you can provide some guidance as to what Nova's up to. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Yes, yeah, so so um, Kate's our uh, residence expert on environmental matters. Um, we have been in a very fortunate position uh, through the Shetland Tide of Array, which has been running for more than five years now that we've collected an immense amount of data. So we have thousands of operational hours. Uh, and there have not been any um, adverse impacts, you know, so the, we found that the marine life works in harmony uh, with the turbines. Uh, and again, you, you may, we've actually this year started to share some of the images and the video footages from that. Um, so again, that's been very powerful in raising uh, awareness and raising understanding. Um, so yes, so I think, um, you know, I think the key is here is 
uh, we're, we're finding um, that if we, by showing this data uh, with uh, in different jurisdictions, it's help. It's adding to the evidence base, um, and it's giving uh, different uh, countries confidence in how the technology is moving forward. And so, uh, Marine Scotland, we've got a very uh, Marine Scotland's been very pioneering in terms of its approach uh, to consenting and, and environmental monitoring. Uh, other countries are sort of following that lead. Um, so Canada, um, again, has is, is, recently been awarded the authorization from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada. Um, and again, so, so again, it's a big focus uh, on monitoring in Canada as well. Uh, and in Wales, uh, Natural Resource Wales, uh, uh, you know, again, we're having conversations about um, a more proportionate approach to, to that as well. So I think where the industry is at um, uh, is you know, I think it's, you know, we've recently had COP26. Uh, there's obviously a massive focus there on uh, moving towards net carbon zero. And I think it was First Minister Mark Drakeford who said, the risk of doing nothing is far greater than the risk posed by potentially installing a tidal turbine. So it, it's all about, um, you know, willing to, willingness, I think, to say, okay, well, let's, let's put the device in the water, let's manage that risk. Uh, Nova's turbines are small. Uh, we've 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 got the uh, pedigree, we've got the track record, we've got the data. Uh, there's not many any adverse effects. We've been very fortunate in Shetland in that there's very good visibility. Um, in other parts of the world, uh, it's, it's that's going to be more challenging. So we're looking at different sensors, different ways in which we can monitor that. Tony can probably add some colour uh, to that about the Bay of Fundy. Uh, but again, I think through working together and sharing best practice. Uh, we're going we're gonna to get to a position sooner where there's more evidence and more comfort with the technology and how it's then going to deliver these benefits to, to society and, and, and work in harmony with the natural environment. Super, thank you, John. Tony, anything you'd add? I mean, I'm, I'm conscious you're probably seeing quite a few UK companies coming and, and looking to force. Are they are they bringing with them a wealth of knowledge of environmental impact and uh, how are you using that within the, the uh, test centre? Uh, yeah, so I think this, I mean, this the, the train of conversation we're on here now is probably its own webinar someday, uh, mm -hmm. something I look forward to doing, but um, you know, I'll just say that it, it's all helpful. And, and really the concerns for the first turbine are not really the issue. I think, I think everybody recognizes the need to actually get on with a demonstration device to learn from it. And in Canada, the regulatory environment is, is adopted of adaptive management approach in terms of the monitoring, you know, change the ability to change the monitoring depending on what, what's observed. I think the real challenge though is, you know, it kind of goes back to this regulatory roadmap that needs to be developed. And what, what is the data that regulators are going to need beyond the first turbine as we get into five or even 15 devices? Right now, that's not known. And so I think very much so we need to push collectively as a sector to try and frame that up that, you know, after the first turbine and after the second and third, what is it really going to be required that a proponent needs to be able to demonstrate conclusively in order to get the array permitted, for instance? And I think that's really the big challenge today. So the work like, for instance, Nova's doing in Shetland, the camera imaging, it's great. I think the trick now is to be able to parlay that into something meaningful for Canadian regulators because the ecosystem is significantly different. And so how, how can we use that uh, kind of achievement and collecting all that visual imagery and talk about what that means for Canadian waters and then demonstrate what's been observed in Shetland and be able to demonstrate that in Canada. In the area where Nova's working, you know, they've got an advantage. The water's a little clearer though, uh, but you can still only see in daytime. And so, you know, the other half of the generation in the evening, like how, we need to be able to provide additional methodologies to cover off some of those risks. And again, not for the first turbine necessarily, but if Nova wants to have a plan to install 15, we got to be able to create that guidance about what are the data sets that's going to satisfy regulators in terms of uh, that allows them to do the risk assessment on the, on the, on the technology. So I mean, just one other point, I don't know if I saw it in the comments, or what, is there a data repository? And I think something that, you know, force is obligated to do by the very nature of what we are, 
is to share the data, the observations that we're collecting. So if anybody wants to see the work that's happening, you know, the Force website is a good spot. We, we're obligated to provide quarterly and annual reports to our regulators on some of the monitoring that's happened, particularly around the baseline, but some of the work around the Open Hydro project. That's all there for the public. Like, so anybody wants to see that, more than welcome, go download that, give us a call and discuss what's in those reports. And a lot of the outcomes, a lot of the scientific research that's going on related to minor effects is all very much made public. And I think that's the way it needs to be. And so like the camera work that Nova has done to the extent that someday that, that could be made public to create an air of transparency so that others can see that and get comfortable themselves and, and, and maybe promote that. I think that's really important. And, and I know there's challenges with doing that. And especially as you get into more complex scientific methods of monitoring, like using hydroacoustics, if you just make that data public, no one's gonna understand what you're talking about. So you have to be able to translate that so it's meaningful for a broader community and, and be able to understand. And that that really takes a lot of work. And I think organizations, you know, like Marine Energy Wales, Marine Renewables Canada, Force, EMEC, I think we all have a role to play in trying to figure out how do we make this data more publicly accessible. Definitely. And I, I think that's probably, Sarah, I'm conscious you've got your hand up, but what I might do is just loop in uh, Magnus very quickly, just because the innovation challenge that I know you touched on in your presentation there looks at addressing some of those questions. I know one of the questions was, how do you how do you do monitoring when it gets dark and you can't actually see anything? And I think that the, the, the innovation that's being driven by a program like the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapults, Marine Energy, Marine Engineering, Energy Engineering, I've got them the wrong way around, Centre of Excellence, um, um, really does do a, a good job at sort of putting a focus on that. Magnus, how do you see that innovation challenge sort of playing out um, and, and delivering for the benefit of the sector, conscious that you've got a lot of academics working with you through universities? Um, how are they involved and what are they doing? Yeah, you can see why we use the acronym MIS. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> but, but thanks for using the full, full term. Um, yeah, so we, we, we had the innovation challenge earlier this summer. And we, we had, you know, a number of responses. Um, we're still, I must admit, still going through that and, you know, identifying what we do next. We have uh, taken at least one company so far to a kind of next stage where we're hoping to run an innovation project with them uh, to help. The, the aim will be to demonstrate some of the new technologies um, that haven't previously been used in this sector as part of that um, project. So that, that's kind of our approach to it, is to, to work with companies to demonstrate new technologies to see if they are suitable for, for addressing this, this challenge that the industry is faced with. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's too early to say whether or not that's going to be the, the right technology to use. Um, and I can't provide much detail at this stage because it is kind of still at a proposal level, but um, that, that's how, how, how we go about doing these things. Hopefully, hopefully next year I'll be able to share, share a bit more information on that. Thank you, Magnus. Sorry, Sarah, I slightly skipped over you, but I wanted to get bring Magnus in there. Um, I'm assuming you've got a similar sort of experience that you can, you can touch on or draw on that might um, hopefully help solve this in the longer term. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, happy happy to hear from from magnus and the work that they're doing i i did just want to share um dp energy um had a, a great success last friday actually and and we've deployed a demonstration monitoring platform at the force site and we are in the in the midst of testing it and working to optimize the sensor performance at the force site this is sort of the uh, the final exam, if you will, of OERA's pathway project, which has been working to try and um, help uh, get a little bit more certainty about monitoring at the force site. And um, I think it's, it's sort of like the first step of what Tony was talking about for what's next and how do we get to that that array monitoring. So um, just give people a little glimmer of hope that we we are um, making some some success and making progress on that. And um, you know we we have just started the the sensor characterization work, but um, it's it's going well and hopefully we will have some some meaningful information from that project um, early next year that will will help inform the rest of the industry. So super. 
Thank you very much, um, and thanks everybody for your inputs. Um, I've just scanned back through the Q&A, and I think we've touched on pretty much most of the, the main themes that are coming through. There are some specific questions, and I'll ask the panel to take a look and perhaps respond directly to some of those questions. Um, I just wanted to raise sort of gratitude. We've got as any W2MRC, um, Marine Renewables Canada, and perhaps invite Elisa, if you um, wanted to say any closing remarks, um, I feel like I should probably give you the opportunity seeing as we've set this up together and we're very grateful for your um, help in getting a lot it would appear of Canadian and um, uh, international um, players at the table and, and asking us questions over to you. Okay yeah thanks very much Jess I mean I would echo some of the same things that, that you've just said um, I think what this kind of demonstrates in getting us all together is that there's a lot of a lot of opportunity to collaborate on things a lot of shared experiences um, and like Tony pointed out around some of the, you know, the environmental monitoring and those those challenges, I think that probably is a topic for something we could all talk about in the future. So I guess I would just leave this by saying thanks to all of you that joined us. Um, but also, you know, hopefully we can continue this kind of dialogue in the future and maybe have a, a follow up kind of webinar discussion. Yeah, I think that would be really interesting. I think potentially bringing in some of the academics um, in Wales, we've got CCAMS, which is brought together in um, Swansea and Bangor universities. And I know MIS are working with a multitude of the Welsh universities. So there's a real robust academic base there that can contribute to the kind of conservation um, knowledge and environmental monitoring requirements. So certainly something I'd be keen, keen for us to pick up as a follow on to this. Um, on that note, I think I'll probably, unless there's anything else from any of the panel that the panel would like to add, if so, make yourselves known and uh, the floor will be yours. <laughs> I'm getting nothing nothing too significant coming through. So just really to extend um, a, a note of gratitude really to our participants and delegates that have attended today. Um, thank you very much for coming along. I hope it's been interesting and informative. Um, and to my fellow panelists, thank you very much. That's possibly been quite a grueling uh, hour and 45. There were some um, good questions in there that uh, hopefully use the grey matter a little bit. Um, but your presence and contribution has been very much appreciated um, and yeah I, I wish the developers the best of luck with getting their technologies in the water in Canada in due course um, and uh, look forward to seeing you all again. Thanks everyone thank Jess. and thank thanks, you very much. thanks MRC right, thanks, thanks for the Jess. opportunity. Thanks, Lisa. Yep thanks thanks everyone. Thank you Fano.